The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter, the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. It's not every day that you can see one of the earliest copies of the Declaration of Independence, and you surely don't expect to be able to see something like that here in Troy, Alabama. Some historical documents and some early editions of some very important books are going to be part of an exhibit here at Troy University during the fall of 2019. Joining me on the show today to talk about this important event are Dr. Chris Schaefer, the Dean of the Libraries at Troy University, and Dr. G.P. Manish, the BB&G Professor of Economic Freedom with the Johnson Center. Dr. Schaefer holds a bachelor's degree from Auburn, a master's degree in library and information science from Alabama, and a doctorate in educational leadership from Alabama State. He's been the uh, director of libraries here at Troy University since 2014. Welcome to the conversations, Chris. Thank you for having me. And GP, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Doug. So let's just start here by talking a little bit about this uh, I exhibit that we have here at Troy this year. And uh, it's coming from a group called Remnant Trust. So if you could tell us a little bit about uh, Remnant Trust. So the Remnant Trust is a group based at Texas Tech University. And their entire mission is to acquire a large collection of uh, antique books and manuscripts and other unique historical artifacts and then in turn make those available to university libraries and other institutions around the country. Mm -hmm. And so like how, how many uh, different documents and, and items do they, they have with the Remnant Trust? Uh, well into the uh, several hundred mm -hmm. and uh, you choose 30 mm -hmm. and so we uh, uh, at the library we got with several different professors, you're one of them, <laughs> and uh, selected various works that um, the faculty here felt would be good for our students to see. And how, how is that this, uh, we end up getting this uh, exhibition here at, at Troy? How did this come about specifically? A serendipity to a large <laughs> degree. In uh, the fall of 2014 I made a trip around the the southeast, mm -hmm. taking a look at different libraries and trying to come up with ideas to modernize our facility and make it more student friendly, you mm -hmm. know, particularly for, for the modern era. And one of the, the universities I visited was Georgia Southern, whose dean was Bede Mitchell. And when I got back to Troy, he sent me an email introducing me to Chris Bex, who is the head of the Remnant Trust. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, it was started by Bex's father, so this is a bit of a family affair, mm -hmm. too. But uh, we've negotiated on and off for about four years, mm -hmm. and the price was, was too high and too high again, and it got whittled down to $5,000, which I thought was pretty much a bargain to bring something like this to, uh, to our students and faculty. Oh. Uh, why is it that you know, uh, you're a librarian and, and so I guess you have some sense of uh, why it, uh, books and documents are, are so important, but just share with us if you can, you know, why, why is it that it's so important that we, we have this opportunity to see items like this here for firsthand? I think sometimes when people view history, and I'm, I'm a lapsed history teacher, I was uh, an AP uh, American and European history teacher, so uh, yeah, I just think there's a cool factor you know, mm -hmm. holding a 1350 copy of uh, uh, the Magna Carta. But I think that you know, actually being able to come into physical contact with the object mm -hmm. is, is something that can really spark the imagination and you know, increased interest in the subject matter. And I mean, the, some of the documents and, and the, the ideas in many mm -hmm. of these books are, are still influencing our, our culture today, aren't, aren't they? True. When uh, I actually uh, wrote a chapter in a book called The Machiavellian Librarian, and so I thought it was hysterical that we actually were able to get a, uh, the first English edition of The Prince. Mm -hmm. And and it's actually, it's, it's like a pocket guide. And so you can imagine some lord or something in England, you know, mm -hmm. hmm, I need to refer to this to see how to deal with the peasant. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's just fine. Uh -huh. And, and so tell us a little bit about some of the uh, different uh, items that are, are part of this ex exhibition. Um, one of the uh, 
One of the rarest things from an American history standpoint is a copy of the Declaration of Independence that was printed in the journals of assembly. And there's only three known copies mm. of that. There's a 4,500 year old, roughly, uh, cuneiform tablet from um, the Assyrians. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mentioned the prints. Uh, we have a copy of the Federalist Papers. We have uh, a work by Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also, um, we have a 600 year old Torah, which is just amazing. We have about, I believe the, the Quran we've got is about 500 years old. There's a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, there's a, a work by Confucius. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is, um, certainly dominated by, by Western thought, but we do have representation from other cultures of the world as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, how long is this uh, exhibit going to be here at Troy? And, and how, if, if somebody's uh, interested in coming to see it, where is it that they would need to, to go to, to see it? Um, it's going to be here through about the first week of December. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we haven't set the exact date that Chris is going to come pick it up. But so, somewhere in that time period, we'll be taking it down. It's on the main floor of the, the Wallace Hall Library on the Troy, Alabama campus. And uh, as long as we're open, everybody's welcome to come see it. And I know and this is uh, something that the Johnson Center is going to be part of this, but we, there's a number of uh, events that you have scheduled to uh, help celebrate or help, I guess, bring to life, I guess, is the way I, I was really thinking about this, bring to life some of the, uh, or make re even more relevant for our people today to understand some of the uh, uh, items that are included in this exhibition. So if you could, tell us a little bit about some of these uh, events that we have scheduled this. Well, we've already had our first one, and Dr. Hal Fulmer talked about uh, Plato's Republic Mm -hmm. just last week and uh, I thought did an excellent job as, as you say of making it relevant to young people. I've got to, to check my cheat sheet here <laughs> but tomorrow we'll have uh, Dr. Martin Olaf from our Dothan campus who will be talking about the Assyrians and uh, cuneiform tablets. Um, September 24th, thank you very much, the Johnson Center is, is bringing in Dr. James Otteson uh, who, who will be doing a lecture on Adam Smith um, October 3rd, Tom Horton, who I know from um, my AP European History days, will be giving a lecture on the Magna Carta. Um, October 10th, Dr. Joseph Kickleiter, who's a former professor of mine from Auburn, will be uh, doing another lecture on the Magna Carta. I'm sorry, Tom was Machiavelli. Um, John Kressler on October 23rd is a professor from Georgia Tech and he will be speaking on uh, the quest for truth in a technological age, the evolving dialogue between science and religion. John may be the smartest person I've ever met in my life, mm -hmm. but he invented some tiny microchip that has changed the way computers work. Mm -hmm. He is a gourmet chef, an expert sommelier, and he's also written books on how to raise children. Mm. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm just fascinated every time I get to bring him here. Uh, he's also started writing historical fiction. Oh. And so he, he is a, a neat guy. On the 30th, Dr. David Carlson will be talking about the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, we'll get a John Stuart Mill uh, lecture from Professor Daniel Jacobson, sponsored again by the Johnson Center. Thank you very much. And then on November 19th, the day the Gettysburg Address was delivered, uh, Hal Fulmer will be talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, all times, except for the two Johnson Center events, are going to be at noon. And you can go to Troy University Libraries on Facebook and see everything I just read to you and view it in a less boring fashion, probably. <laughs> Well, I, I think, in, and these are some of the uh, uh, books that you have from the, the exhibition, right? Yes. And, and so, I mean, this is uh, these are like very early editions uh, of these books. I, I believe all of them are first editions. Okay. The, um, right here, the, is this Adam Smith, I believe? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a three volume set. That's the first uh, Irish edition. Okay. So it was printed in Dublin. And I believe the mills are first British editions, and then there's an American first edition in there too. Okay. So uh, again, these are, these are really uh, neat things to be able to have yes. there. And, and 
you know, and then we want to talk a little because we have a, a number of uh, economists uh, who are represented in this, uh, in part because you did reach out to some people at the university, including you. Know, so we made, we made sure to include some economists. Uh, but I mean, they were also represented in the uh, collection that the Remnant Trust has to begin with. And, and so you know, the Remnant Trust mentions as their, their mission that they want to uh, support or keep documents and books related to our, our history of individual liberty and, and human dignity. So you might, at first glance, some of our, our readers might think, well, what's the connection between economics and, and, and human dignity and, and, ac and, and uh, individual liberty? But you know, GP, there, there is some of a connection here, right? Yes, I, I think you know, a lot of economists would argue that, that the introduction especially in the wealth of nations, of some of the basic principles of economics is what allowed for the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, you know, lifted some of the sort of reg regulations on the British economy that had been carried over from the medieval past um, and allowed for uh, industrialization and progress to start there and then gradually spread across the world. So um, the ideas that Adam Smith introduced in the wealth of nations before him, David Hume, um, but mm -hmm. after that, you know, uh, other economists like Ricardo and, and Mill, um, all of that sort of propagate that same tradition. And, and so M. M. Smith is the, 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 I guess, chronologically, the, the first of the uh, economists that we have uh, uh, featured in this. And, and uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, Smith, his, his life, and when, when he was sort of situated in, in history. Well, I mean, Smith was part of uh, what has been called the Scottish Enlightenment, right? There mm -hmm. was a burst of intellectual sort of uh, uh, contributions coming from Scotland. Um, as I mentioned, David Hume, who was a very good friend um, of Adam Smith's, uh, but also others such as Francis Hutcheson, uh, Adam Ferguson. These were all Scottish philosophers mm -hmm. who had contributed uh, you know, works to political philosophy before um, Smith. So there was a tradition in Edinburgh and Glasgow, uh, you know, sort of discussing various aspects of politics, political philosophy, ethics, um, economics. Uh, now, Sm Smith's great contribution, um, you know, it's not like Smith sat there one day, as I tell my students, it's not like Smith sat there one day and just thought of economics, right? He didn't wake up one day in the morning in 1776 and just said, well, I'm gonna write economics. That, that, that's not how, though so sometimes he's portrayed in that way mm -hmm. as just being the father of economics. That's not really true. Uh, you know, uh, there's been a lot of research done into the fact that there was a lot of uh, sophisticated thought in the medieval era, even mm -hmm. amongst the scholastic philosophers on economic issues. You know, there was a time when everybody thought the scholastics had nothing to say about economics, nothing meaningful to say. That's been revised. Um, so there was a tradition before Smith um, talking about economic issues. There was the physiocrats in France who wrote before him. Um, you know, the 1750s and 60s. So it wasn't like he was the first economist, but in many ways he was the first synthesizer, mm -hmm. um, the first, you know, this is the first comprehensive work on economics, the wealth of nations, mm -hmm. right, where economics is treated not as being part of um, a work on political philosophy or ethics, mm -hmm. um, but, but where economics is the centerpiece, the standpoint. Um, and in many ways, you could argue that David Hume contributed a lot to that, even though he never wrote a treatise, um, but he wrote some very influential essays um, on interest and money and capital, et cetera, um, that also ob obviously inspired Smith. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in The Wealth of Nations, Smith, I, I guess he may not have been the first person to identify this idea of spontaneous order, but it, it's probably one of the places where it's uh, most comprehensively, and one of the earliest places, I mean, most comprehensively laid out the I idea of spontaneous order, which is tremendously actually relevant for the idea that people can have individual liberty, right? Yes, uh, I mean, this is, you're touching on the famous, you know, phrase of his on the invisible hand and how mm -hmm. the invisible hand, uh, uh, Smith's, you know, I think there's a passage there where he talks about, you know, the butcher and the baker, and how do you ensure in a system of a division of labor and specialization that the butcher and the baker coordinate their actions to sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, satisfy each other's wants? Because you know the butcher has to make something for his customers, the baker has to make something for his customers. Um, do you need one authority to sort of tell mm -hmm. everybody to do um, what they should do? And Smith said, "Well, no. You know, there is this sort of uh, mechanism or these sort of uh, uh, these forces at work." Um, that allow for each of us individually to coordinate our actions mm -hmm. in a complicated system of division of labor. 
Um, and, and you're right, and that is a crucial element towards are then understanding how this coordination takes place, how does this system called the market economy work, mm -hmm. where you know, geographically and temporally we're also uh, disconnected from each other. Um, so you know, production processes take a long time, they're done all over the world, but you know, when you walk into your local Publix or your Walmart, you have these products waiting for you. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the producer know? five years ago to start a production process, maybe somewhere in India or China or Egypt to get that product to you. And in, in many ways, Smith's sort of conceptualization of some of these issues is crucial for later economists to work and understand those aspects um, better. And, and again, you, you with the invisible hand at work here, like nobody would have to say, like, okay, GP, you're gonna be the butcher, yeah. and Chris, you're, you'll, you'll be the, uh, the, the baker, and, or, you know, and I'll, I'll is, tell me that I have to be the brewer or anything. Like, we can sort of choose our, ourselves what all we want to do, and then somehow, again, this, uh, the, this invisible hand, even though we're all choosing what we want to do on our own, we end up with enough coordination that we have everything we need for our dinner, right? right. Yes, and, and you know, Smith's uh, sort of introduced a lot of these ideas in connection with uh, criticism of what is called mercantilism today. Mm -hmm. So before, you know, when Smith was writing in 1776, most uh, prominent economists, or at least there weren't any actual economists, but advisors to various monarchs through the you know, 18th, but before that, maybe the 17th and 16th century, the overarching advice they would give to their monarchs is, well, you know, a country gets wealthy when you export more than you import. Mm -hmm. That was one of the fundamental sort of uh, uh, aspects of economic thought before Smith was writing. Um, and of course, connected to that, you have a whole set of recommendations on various regulations you have to put in place in order to make that happen. Um, in many ways, the quintessential mercantilist would have been Colbert, uh, who was the advisor to Louis XVI. Um, or you know, even the Elizabethan regulations put in place in England in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the you know, 16th century or before that, 15th century, were all sort of aspects of this mercantilist uh, way of thinking. A and Smith attacked the mercantilist uh, you know, thought in the sense of he said, look, we can all prosper, all countries together can prosper. Trade is not a zero sum game, mm -hmm. right? If everybody has to export more than they import, that means we can't all get richer together. Right. It necessarily means it's a it's a win you know I get some you lose. Smith's great contribution was to point out that actually you know we can all prosper through trade and all of us can get better off together, and that was a revolutionary idea. And then that was an idea that that uh, the, the next uh, economist we have here uh, really picked up in, to to run with as uh, David Ricardo. So tell us a little bit about uh, Ricardo. Uh, I mean, Ricardo had uh, many contributions, but you're right. I mean, his one contribution that today still stands true, and every economist, every in every principles class, we teach this: the law of comparative advantage. What is it that allows for the greater productivity of the division of labor? Um, Ricardo introduced this idea in the international setting, mm -hmm. so he took, you know, he sort of formalized, if you could say, some of the the points that Smith had made. He made it more formal, he came up, he, he, he improved on Smith's insights, um, and you know, came up with the, with the, with the great uh, sort of uh, conclusion that even if one country like England is better and more productive at doing everything than another country like say um, France or Spain, uh, they can still benefit, the two countries can still benefit through trade. So mm -hmm. even if one country is more productive and better at doing everything, there's still room to trade. Um, and we still, I mean, it's the oldest in a sense, uh, apart from the laws of supply and demand, which also have evolved over time, but you could say that in many ways the law of comparative advantage is the one sort of thing that has remained true for more than 200 years. Uh, now we, it's still taught in principles courses mm -hmm. today. So that's, that's great, Ricardo, one of Ricardo's great contributions. And and again, it's, uh, this is ex extremely relevant, I mean, obviously, even in today because uh, since uh, I guess in some sense mercantilist thinking is, is back yes. in fashion with uh, President Trump thinking you're know, looking at the idea of a, a, our nation needs to run a big trade surplus, yes. which is, is very much back to what the mercantilists were thinking about. So I mean, these ideas are, are, are still relevant 
very much relevant today, right? Yes, I mean, uh, yes, uh, Ricardo or Smith, you know, they saw a tweet by Trump saying that we <laughs> win when, <laughs> when we have a surplus and we lose when we have a deficit would say, well, you know, you should read some of my books. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, these are things that we, they criticized the mercantilists about. Uh, now, of course, conditions today are different, and you'd have to apply those same truths differently, and economists are doing that. Um, but, but, but the basic core principles are still, we still take them from the works of Smith and Ricardo. Now, the uh, next uh, person to talk about here is uh, that we have a couple of books as part of this exhibition is uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, who was both like uh, an economist and I guess a, a philosopher as well, because he also made some important contributions in, in ethics. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, Mill was more than an economist, you're right. He made contributions. I think he had a book on logic um, as well. Um, he made contributions in various fields. But of course, first and foremost, he's an economist. Mm -hmm. um, and he's known for, again, a great work, Principles of Political Economy, written in 1848. Um, and Mill sort of was uh, the smith of his time. So what, he, what Mill's great contribution in this work was to take all the work that had been done between 1776 and 1848 and sort of synthesize it into one sort of core book. Um, and in fact, after this book was written for the next 40, 50 years, this was the textbook that was, you know, that every uh, economic student would use. Mm -hmm. um, if he said, well, you have a question on something, then look at Mill's principles. <laughs> but even economists built, starting from Mill's principles. So he had a huge influence on economic thought in mm -hmm. the 19th century. And of course, his other work, which is again very relevant today, On Liberty, uh, where he argues very forcefully for uh, the right to free speech, um, the right uh, to think, um, and the right to discuss and associate and, and, and talk about various ideas as the best way um, to, to actually, for the best ideas to win out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, makes a strong case that if you do have an idea you don't like, you should allow that to be discussed because that's the most efficient and the best way in which to show the fallacies in that way uh, of thinking. Without doubt, that has huge implications for today. I guess the, the whole idea of a marketplace of ideas, it just sort of shows yes. then like economic thought as it became more mature than also being taken out to help explain things outside of like the narrow economic uh, realm, right? Yes, um, Emil was the quintessential utilitarian. Um, mm -hmm. So for him, it was all about, you know, talking about uh, the, what are the means that are needed to achieve the ends of peace and progress and prosperity? And y you're right, he, he also believed that freedom of speech, just civil liberties as we call it, uh, he was able to integrate that with economic liberties to create uh, a system of liberties that are essential for us to prosper and progress. And then the, the final economist we have featured here is uh, Another gentleman who, who's have a, having a, a revival in, in recent yes. years is Karl Marx. So, tell us a little bit about Marx a, as an economist, in addition to us, like where he he fit in in this economics timeline. Well, again, Marx is a, a lot of things along with being an economist. Mm -hmm. He started off as a philosopher, and he's had huge influence um, on philosophy as well. But capital was his. You know, towards the end of his life, Marx focused more and more on economics. Um, and in, in many ways, capital is influenced, ironically, by a lot of the works of Ricardo. Um, uh, he, he takes a lot of, uh, so there are, you know, there are many ways to interpret and read Ricardo. Um, and Marx uh, read it, read, took certain principles that Ricardo had introduced, especially the labor theory of value, or not introduced, but formalized, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and derived some of his core ideas, uh, criticizing the capitalist system. Uh, such as you know the the law of the, the exploitation theory of profit that profit comes from exploiting workers, um, and that over time you're going to have a polarization of the proletariat and the capitalists on the one hand, setting up a stage for the arrival of communism and socialism. Um, these ideas were actually derived uh, quite a bit from Ricardo. Uh, so if, if, if you could elaborate a little bit on this idea of the labor theory of values. Uh, it, 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 is very important in Marx's thought. He didn't come up with that, but it was something that was already there in economics. I guess, or even going back to Adam Smith. Um, uh, yes, there was. Smith had, uh, you know, Smith had many different theories of talking about price. Uh, Ricardo took just the labor theory of value and formalized it. And when Ricardo became popular, you know, that that was the idea that dominated economic thought. Uh, you know, the classical economists had uh, an issue that they could never overcome, which is the water diamond paradox. Again, something we talk about in our principles courses, which is, you know, Adam Smith said, well, 
Of course, when we talk about prices, we want to we, we, we think about utility, satisfaction, right? That, that prices are governed by satisfaction. But then he said, well, water is so cheap and diamonds are so expensive, but surely water gives us more satisfaction. Uh, yeah, now, of course, the, the, the later economists and the marginalist you know, revolution in the late 1870s, uh, the, they said the question is being posed the wrong way. You're thinking about one bottle of water versus one diamond, not water versus diamonds. Uh, but, but the classical economists couldn't solve this problem, and so Ricardo, uh, you know, one of the answers that Ricardo said, uh, gave was, well, he said, look, uh, prices are governed by the amount of labor time that goes into producing them. It's, it, it, of course, only goods that satisfy needs are going to be traded, but what really matters is the amount of labor time that goes into producing mm -hmm. them. Uh, and of course, what Marx uh, then said was, well, if, if labor is a source of all value, then how do you explain profit? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, profit must come from from exploitation if you accept the labor theory of value because the, the, uh, the capitalist doesn't put in any labor time. So where does he get his income from? It must be because he pays the worker less than what he has actually produced. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, the root, of Marx's genius was to, show, was to see that the labor theory of value ha contains the, the core of, or, or the, the sort of foundations of the exploitation theory of profit. Mm -hmm. and, and that of course is the, is the, it still remains, including in you know, the thought of someone like a Bernie Sanders, uh, it, you know, this, the belief that capitalists gain at the expense of the masses. Mm -hmm. that, that if you see you know, billionaires and millionaires, it's because they have taken something that ought to be shared with the workers. Whereas, as we, once we move beyond that, we recognize that there were other factors, uh, there other factors that were going into <laughs> production that were important there. Yes, and, and you know, uh, as I was mentioning, you know, with the marginalist revolution in economics in 1870, uh, you know, people like Karl Menger, Leon Walras, William Stanley Jevons, uh, they, they criticized the labor theory of value, and then they were able to explain prices as being governed by utility. Mm -hmm. And there, then, you, you, you can explain profit without talking about profit is largely the payment or the, the income you get for bearing uncertainty. Um, that's the role the entrepreneur plays. Um, and so that's a different way of thinking about it as compared to Marx. Well, I guess w one thing I want to bring up for you to ask both of you about is all this, um, I mean, I think there would be some people across the higher education, across the different uh, areas that might look at some of these uh, items here and say like, oh, th this is really just sort of like a Western history. Or this is really just uh, you know, very much a, a, an ethnocentric uh, focused uh, aspect of, of take on history and culture. Um, how would you, you respond to a, a, a critique like that? Well, I, I think the, the concepts in these books are uh, valid for every culture country mm -hmm. in the world and uh, and, and of course as, as far as um, works in the collection go uh, you know I, I, at the beginning I listed several we have right. that actually are from uh, places other than Western Europe or mm -hmm. the United States so that would be my answer uh, I mean I, I would referring specifically to economics I mean you can make the case also that for whatever reason there were no great works in economics in coming from India or, or, or China or, or Persia in those years in the 17th and 18th centuries. So uh, if you are you know, looking for great works in economics, you are going to necessarily, for whatever historical reason, be, be taken to, the, to Europe. And, and a part of that would probably be because, I mean, in Adam Smith, he's, he's, he's seen markets at work. He's exactly. seen the division right. of, of labor. There's a great example that Casey has of the pin factory yes. that he, he's visited. And I mean, he's seen the division of labor. He's seen markets at, yes. at work. He's, and that's why you know, probably he's had the ability to start thinking about this in, invisible hand. And, and why that is the case, we don't know. I don't think uh, his economic historians have the right answer to that yet. Right. But you, know, you sort of had to see markets in operation. Yes. And that's, you know, that's where economic freedom has, has sort of burst forth uh, yes. in, in Europe and in Western Europe. Well, thanks very much for coming on and talking about this. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a great opportunity, a great event here for uh, Troy University. We're glad to be a part of it. And thanks for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations.